For a 59th consecutive week, we've got Ohio State football talk for you as we do again each and every week with uh, Tony Gerdeman from Buckeye Scoop. And we also, of course, have Steve Hellwagon, senior Big Ten writer at 247 Sports. You can catch him at Bucknuts. How you guys doing today? Doing great. Doing good. So I try to outline this each and every week, uh, viewers. I hope you realize what you got here. We've got two of the very best, typically Kevin Noon from Buckeye Grove on board as well, but uh, Steve and Tony, two of the very best. So lock it in for Ohio State Football Talk here, but certainly join them on their respective sites, Steve at Bucknuts and Tony at Buckeye Scoop. All right, guys, uh, before we dive into what's always a great debate when you talk about top 10 lists and all-time teams and all-decade teams, we will get to that. Uh, in regards to what the Big Ten Network is releasing currently. But linebacker Gabe Powers, uh, top prospect for the 2022 class out of Marysville, uh, is basically saying that uh, Ohio State's high in his list, very um, attracted to come to Columbus, which uh, certainly isn't a big surprise, Steve. Yeah, uh, Gabe's probably the top prospect in Ohio in the 2022 class. And... Um, uh, again, probably a national top 50 player. Some of the networks have begun ranking the guys who will be juniors this coming year. Marysville, they play in the Ohio Capital Conference, and I don't know their exact division, but it wouldn't surprise me if they are in with the Hilliard and, and uh, Dublin schools on the northeast side of Col or northwest side of Columbus, as well as maybe Delaware, because those are all very short drives for them. I know a lot of the OCC divisions are decided by enrollment and travel and <clears throat> a lot of factors that go into it. Well, let's just suffice to say that he plays against great competition in one of the best leagues in Ohio, the Ohio Capital Conference. And uh, it's like a 40 team league, all the suburban schools around Columbus. And uh, Gabe, as a sophomore, really distinguished himself this past season. So he's a guy that uh, the Buckeyes are definitely uh, pinning their hopes on for 2022. I don't know that you would put him in the same stratosphere as Jack Sawyer, the outstanding uh, player from Pickerington North, uh, who is verbaled, obviously, uh, for 2021 as a national top 10 prospect. But he is an outstanding prospect. I know that uh, – there were some videos that surfaced here just this week that uh, he was working out uh, in the shadow of Ohio Stadium uh, with uh, Harry Butch Reynolds, who's a personal trainer and former Olympic uh, gold and silver medalist. So uh, that sounds like a good guy to, to, to learn uh, how to become uh, faster and more athletic. I think uh, he'd be a good one uh, to, uh, to, to learn from. So there's some of the the MO on uh, on Powers, I think he's, a, again, as we say, a tremendous prospect in that uh, 2022 class. Uh, Marysville has not, over the years, produced an abundance of Ohio State caliber players. We were talking off the air. I think there was a player from there, Chase Blackburn, maybe a decade or more ago, and uh, he went on to the NFL, as I recall. But otherwise, uh, you know, it's 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 not a, a high Division One producing type program. But then again, you look at uh, the 2021 class, you've got a kid, Reed Carrico, coming from Ironton, Ohio, and it's very rare that uh, that they produce Ohio State caliber players as well. Jermon Jackson, 25 or 30 years ago, may have been the last one. So uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, you could find guys anywhere. And, and as I outlined, uh, Marysville at least plays the best competition in central Ohio. So to me, Powers, and I'm, I'm just digging up a little bit more info on him because I wanted to throw in uh, 6'4", 220 pounds. And uh, as according to our database at 24-7, uh, he's already got 18 offers and he's just going into his junior year. So there's a lot of people uh, that, uh, that really like him. And I'm, I'm just laughing at our database page on him the uh, head, head and shoulder shot has him in a Michigan T-shirt at a Michigan game. And note to self, we've, we've got to fix that. So, <laughs> neat, neat updated photo of Gabe Powers. I'm just going to put that on my to-do list. Well, based on his frame of reference uh, in terms of what football he's seen, I, I got to credit that he's not going around with the, the you know, not jumping on the bandwagon in terms of winning. Uh, at least let's credit that. What you got, Tony? I think it's awesome for a high school kid to be able to work with Butch Reynolds, you know, only a, a former Olympian, former Ohio State speed coach. 
And I know when uh, our Mark Givler talked with both Gabe Powers and Butch Reynolds a, a few weeks ago, Butch referenced his time at Ohio State working with bigger athletes and getting them faster. So when you're talking about Gabe Powers, a 2022 kid who's already 6'4", 220, now working to keep that speed and, and keep that athleticism. I think that's, you know, that, that's a huge, huge um, opportunity for him to, uh, if he wants to play linebacker rather than defensive end, if he can keep that speed, that'll be one way to do it is by staying fast. Cause he's going to be a big kid by the time he lands anywhere. And I know Ohio state feels pretty good about him. And I think Buckeye fans probably assume he's, he's in and really until we see any evidence that he's not, I think most people expect him to eventually be a Buckeye. Yeah. And I think linebacker, as we've kind of outlined, when you lose seven linebackers in the next uh, two years, the four seniors this year and the three juniors for next year, uh, I think it is certainly a position where they need to replenish and get the best players in the country. And he's ranked 43rd by 24-7 sports nationally, so that's pretty good. His offer list is outstanding as I stroll, scrolled down through it. As I mentioned, nearly 20 offers. Florida State, uh, and then, of course, a lot of the schools in this footprint, Kentucky, Michigan, Michigan State, Minnesota, Notre Dame, Penn State, Pittsburgh, and then drop it on down, uh, Stanford, great academic school, Tennessee, USC, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. So he's got everybody in this footprint and uh, a lot of the top schools nationally that are already in on him as a high school junior, kind of like we saw, I alluded to Jack Sawyer, uh, although Sawyer shut it down very early in the process and said, I'm going to Ohio State. So uh, it would be uh, obviously when you've got a national top 50 guy within – uh, a half hour of your campus, which Marysville is kind of on the cusp of that, about a half hour away. It was so important to get Zach Harrison a couple of years ago coming from Delaware County. Uh, this kid coming from Marysville and Union County, just right up Route 33, uh, to be that highly rated, he's a must get for high school. I pride myself in knowing where NFL players went to college, but if they didn't go to a Power 5 school, I give myself a bit of a pass. Chase Blackburn, University of Akron. 10-season oh. career at the NFL uh, with the Giants and oh, the Panthers. Uh, Two-time Super Bowl champion. Wasn't any kind of Pro Bowl outstanding great player. But, uh, man, to, to to log 10 years in the NFL and win two Super Bowls. And he played for those teams. You know, he he was active. He was playing. Uh, had a, a role on those teams. So, University of Akron for Chase Blackburn. I thought I was – I think off the air I mentioned Boston College. One of you guys said Virginia Tech. And in the back of my mind, I I was kind of like Miami, Ohio, maybe, Mac. But that was down the other way on 33, Rob Carpenter uh, hmm. uh, from a 1,000 years ago. And, and uh, Bobby Carpenter's dad, he played at Miami. So, oh, well. And also I was the Giants. Blacksburg instead of Blackburn, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, in terms of schools represented in the live chat right now, in addition to Ohio State, of course, we've got uh, Miami fans, Nebraska fans, Florida State fans, I see. And of course, we will have our Michigan college fans as well. College football. We're all united in college. That's right. That's I'm hoping, live chance here. I'm hoping this is the year Scott Frost becomes the UCF Scott Frost, as opposed to the Nebraska Scott Frost of the past couple of years, because you know, for sure, the first year you expect some struggles. I thought they would start to take off. I thought he would be perfect for that, and he may still be, but it's kind of uh, concerning, you know, just even like losing J.D. Spielman and, and things like that where you're you're missing the positive signs that you absolutely, that I absolutely expected. I, I called him Urban Meyer 2.0 like two years ago. Yeah, getting kids to go and play in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, you know, Tommy Frazier is not walking through that door, you know, so, uh, you, you know, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a tough thing, I think, um, because the, the recruiting base, um, when they were a big 12 team, they could go into Texas and, and get a few guys because then they could say, well, we're going to play most of the schools here in the state of Texas. You'll get to see them play or whatever, but, uh, you know, and, and they more than held their own in that conference up until, you know, leaving it. And uh, just it's kind of been the Penn State effect. They came to the – they joined the big conference, and it just hasn't uh, materialized maybe the way that they thought it would. Been through a couple coaches already since joining the conference. And, uh, you know, I just think when you look at it, um, 
uphill battle, but not one that, that they can't win. I mean, I always had success regardless of the controversy that's going on now. Uh, Wisconsin, obviously kind of a similar model, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more entrenched in recruiting uh, kids from the Midwest. And I think Nebraska has got a skew more toward Chicago and uh, those areas that there's population. St. Louis, Ohio State's recruiting the heck out of St. Louis right now. And that's not, you know, too far. I mean, it's six, probably six hours, five, six hours, I bet, over to uh, to uh, Omaha but uh, uh, and to Lincoln. But uh, I know the, the Buckeyes are playing them this year. Isn't that right, Tony, at home? Does that yep. sound right? Yeah, so we'll get another up close uh, vantage point with them this year, and theoretically. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's time uh, that they've got a veteran quarterback. It kills them that Spielman, who's a difference maker, is walking away from that program. And and um, you know his adopted dad is Rick Spielman, the general manager of the. Minnesota Vikings, it makes you wonder if maybe he would go play at Minnesota or, you know, something along those lines. But, uh, you know, haven't heard anything in that regard. I, I'm not sure I've heard where he's going. And if he wants to enroll, you know, or get started, it's it's time. Although I think he had some personal things he was also trying to work through as well. Yeah, he had gone home to Minnesota sometime in the last, uh, you know, prior to COVID, sometime during uh, workouts after the season had gone back to home uh, in Minnesota. So you would think PJ Fleck would be on that trail. You yeah. would think, um, yeah, Tommy Frazier's not walking through that door, but Adrian Martinez was already in the room. And most people thought that he was going to be good. good enough. He accounted for 25 touchdowns the year before he threw three touchdowns in their final seven games last year. Uh, Tony, to your point, they got off to the rough start in Scott Frost's first season with six consecutive losses, but over the final six games, they went four and two. Last second loss, final kick to Iowa, last play of the game, took the Buckeyes to the wire, 36-31 game in Columbus. So they're losing to two uh, top teams, especially Ohio State, a top three to five team in the nation, and they they were starting to, to really look like they turned the corner. I almost liken Scott Frost uh, to a lesser degree of a Jim Harbaugh coming home, success on the field as a big-time player, also in the coaching ranks, had turned around a program in, in Frost's um, case in Harbaugh's multiple programs, and it just seemed like the perfect fit. He's going to be have all the cachet, and the, the recruits are going to be attracted to him, and it's going to get off to a great start. And if anything, Steve, you mentioned the, the success at Wisconsin and Iowa, despite the high-caliber players being recruited there. Nebraska, even under Mike Riley, out recruited, if you believe in the rankings, Iowa and Wisconsin. Just yeah, and you get it done on the field. And you also have Minnesota now as a force in that division too. Uh, they could be a top twenty-five team uh, for years to come with PJ Fleck kind of entrenched there. If that is his final, well, he's so young. I expect he'll probably take another job or two before he's retiring. But, and that's not even meant as a shot at him because I know people think he's kind of quirky and all that, but. You can't argue with the success that they had. I mean, they handed Penn State their first loss last year, isn't that right? And uh, I think it was a two uh, two eight no teams were playing each other there, and then uh, they dropped the ball a couple times there at the end of the regular season. But they came back and had a great bowl win. And um, you know, the quarterback, I Tony, I saw a, one of the tweets you had there that maybe we don't think too much about their quarterback or haven't said enough about their quarterback, uh, T Tanner Morgan, yeah. uh, tremendous player. And, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't get the credit he deserved for pulling them through some tight, tight games last year. Uh, Going to hurt not having Antoine Winfield Jr. there. My goodness, uh, what a difference maker he was. Didn't he have two picks in that Penn State uh, game, I think, and one at the end to seal it? And, uh, you know, and he made a play, and I don't know which game it was, but it was just an amazing interception. It might have been that Penn State game. But uh, a lot of Buckeye fans, you know, as that year was unfolded, were like, why isn't he at Ohio State? And, you know, you think about it, Antoine Winfield Sr., you know, went there in the late 90s from Akron Garfield, and there's still family, from what I understand, in the Akron area. But I don't think Ohio State really pursued him all that uh, closely. I want to say Antoine did play with Minnesota for a while, but I think he was living in Dallas 
or in Texas when uh, the son was being recruited and um, for whatever reason, Ohio State, you know, he may not have fit the mold maybe as a big corner because he's, I don't think he's that big of a guy, but uh, man, did he live up to everything his dad was all about as a college player, no doubt. He was, he did camp at Ohio State looking for an offer because I was, I was standing over Antoine Winfield Sr.'s shoulder on the sideline inside the WAC when Antoine Winfield was working out junior and you could see you know, his dad wanted that offer, and, and it just – I assume it just comes down to he's 5'8", and they, yeah. he would have had to have looked like exactly like his dad. But even then, they were, you know, I assume looking at him as a safety, and now he, it doesn't really necessarily work out for him. I think Antoine Winfield, you look at Ohio State's defense now, like Antoine Winfield Sr. would have been the perfect slot corner. He would have – you know, what Sean Wade did last year, yep. like Antoine Winfield would be made for that. But senior, I mean, they could have they could have used a, a good safety the last few years to play alongside Jordan Fuller, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, to me, it just came down to height, and and it just didn't fit that didn't didn't meet the requirements. It was like a ride at Kings Island or something. Yeah, I have three really quick Antoine Winfield senior stories. He was the very first player that I called on the telephone who told me he was going to Ohio State, and I. In either it was me or Bill Kerr, like uh, we were working for separate outfits at that time, broke the news of that in 1994. He's the very first player who, who basically told me to report that he had committed to Ohio State, which I thought that was pretty cool. Two, um, in 1998, he was one of, if not the best defensive back in all of college football. And I was working with Jeff Rapp at Buckeye Sports Bulletin, and Jeff had gotten up at the press box. They're playing Minnesota to go get a hot dog or a Coke, and he comes back and notes that Minnesota has scored a touchdown. And he says, well, how the heck did that happen? And Minnesota was, you know, probably like five and five type team back then in 98. And I said, well, it's the strangest thing, Jeff. They sent Johnson on a uh, – go pattern down the right sideline. He got behind Antoine Winfield and caught the ball in stride and went for a 60 yard touchdown. And we looked at each other and said, that's the only time that's ever happened in, <laughs> in four years. And, and he missed Jeff blinked and he missed it. And uh, then the third one was at West Virginia, the first game of the 1998 season. Um, West Virginia had recruits at the game. It was a Saturday night game on CBS and Ohio State won the game 34-17, to 17, was preseason number one ranked team in the country with Katzenware, Winfield, and Boston, Jermaine, Partridge, and a pear tree, a really good team. And so the game's over, and they conduct the interviews in the weight room, which is, at that point, it was field level in the end zone off the visiting locker room. And you could see over to the West Virginia side where they were doing some interviews, and, and their players are coming and going over on the other side of the room – and their recruits slowly start to gravitate over where they're not supposed to be to the Ohio State side of the room. And one of the kids who was there on an unofficial visit to watch the game, when Antoine Winfield's interview was over, he goes, Antoine, you're the best. And Antoine Winfield flashed him that smile and said, gee, thanks, dog. <laughs> just, just a genuine moment, genuine dude and great player. Played a long time in the NFL, got swindled out of some money. I know that uh, by a former Ohio State wrestler who fashioned himself as a uh, financial, you know, whiz bang guy and uh, took him for some money. And and uh, I don't know. Now his son's going to make millions of dollars playing football. And won the Thorpe Award without an inter interception. Didn't need it. Didn't need it. They didn't throw his way except that one time Minnesota. Best tackler I've ever seen in football. I was just yeah. going to say, yeah. Great run support corner. Just amazing. Folks, where do you get this analysis? Where does this happen? You got Steve Hill. Well, we have to talk about that. guys who played in 1997 because no one's playing right now. So, hey, I'll do this all day. Sure, we can do this. And speaking of which, segue right into the All Big Ten team, All Decade team. This might be a little bit difficult to analyze because this is um, courtesy of the Big Ten Network. They're releasing a player two or three per day, something to that degree. I can't uh, quite track this, so it's not just a list looking through the various positions like an All-America team. Um, again, the, the release of a player or two per day. So I guess we'll just have to 
make our way through this and and see what catches anybody's eye. The the latest release with Jabril Peppers, Michigan, uh, twenty fourteen through sixteen, um, as an all decade kind of special teams player of sorts, I guess is what they've listed him. I've not, I can't see the. Um, I think it's just an all purpose point. defense, which all, is not all a purpose. Thing. All purpose. Um, yeah, I mean that's okay. He's a utility player. Uh, you know, a very good, very good player. Um, I don't know that he was all he was ever cracked up to be. He he was a he was a blue blue chip type prospect. So when guys arrive at Michigan with that top twenty five national pedigree, it's hard to shake that tag. And even if you make a few plays, that people think you're better than maybe you really are. Um, you know, if, if I was going to say all purpose, a guy on the other side who I would think would be like a Curtis Samuel, but I don't know if he's going to make this list or not. But I definitely have some feelings about this. I don't know what direction you want to take it, but uh, I don't know. There's there's some interesting picks in here. I'll say that. I'll just start off by saying Wyatt Davis, on the basis of one year, has no business being on the first team all decade offensive line. And I know timing <clears throat> works against him because he only had one year in the decade. But, you know, I don't think his full body of work matches up with uh, – is Elfline on the second team? Is that what I'm being told? I, I, I It's so convoluted the way they dropped this thing. I know Price is on the first team, which is yeah. how it should be. I got so, we could We'll talk about Price. Keep going, Steve. Yeah, but that I, – I think if Elfline's on the second team and Davis is on the first team, that's backwards because – Elfline was like a three and a half year starter or something, maybe even four full years. I don't even know. Um, <laughs> and, and played on a national championship team. You know, the the one the one to me, and um, I got a basketball one too that we'll we can touch on in a moment. And and I like the premise of what they've done here. And I think that the panel that they used for basketball was a lot of their own in-house people. Uh, sprinkled in with some Teddy Greenstein and some Mike DeCourcy who may have more of a world view, but um, at least for the basketball one, I didn't notice anybody with an Ohio State pedigree, uh, which there's plenty. I mean, Jim Jackson's Fox affiliated. He would have been a perfect guy to vote on that. Um, for football, I'm not sure who's making these calls. Maybe we'll get the panel when it's all done. Uh, you got to figure uh, – I would assume Josh Perry and uh, maybe Lauren Itis are probably on that, but and Stan Jackson and, and maybe Stan Jackson as well. And and Glenn Mason has Ohio State ties, although you know people remember him more as the Minnesota head coach. But aside from all that, uh, you know, I will never understand how they picked running backs and went with. Jonathan Taylor, I know 2,000 yard rusher, that's great. And Saquon Barkley, kind of the human highlight film from Penn State, also that's great. But to the exclusion of Ezekiel Elliott. And, uh, you know, as my friend Terry Gilliam, you know, I, I break out this line all the time. He was busting chops on some guy about uh, all the work that he had done or something. And he says, I, I see all the pictures you've taken, which were hero. Uh, you know, talking to his fellow photographer, I see all the pictures. I see your stuff's published everywhere as he was cutting on the guy. Uh, for Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley, I see all the national championships you won. And Ohio State rode Ezekiel Elliott to the national championship, the holy grail of the sport. And people say, oh, he's never a first-team All-American. Well, those teams are announced anywhere from November the 30th to December the 7th. Anytime before or after, you know, every website's got one. And as of that day, he was not the first team All-American. But when he had 700 yards in the postseason, Wisconsin, number 12 ranked team and top defense in the country, Alabama, number one team, and Oregon, number two, or vice versa, whatever that was. Um, again, I see all the 200-yard games Jonathan Taylor had against teams that were ranked in the top two. Uh, I see all the 200-yard games Saquon Barkley had against teams that were ranked in the top two, zero. So I, I don't, I, I do not endorse. If the whole selection is flawed like that is, then it's a, it's a sham, is what it is. Because 
you should be determined by, I know individual success and statistics have to figure into this and they rightfully should. And maybe those guys had better numbers, but this guy didn't have bad numbers. What was it 17 or 1800 the year they won it? And then another 1800 the year after. Plus he was the AAU Sullivan Award winner, which was the best or the top amateur athlete in the United States of America for the calendar year of 2014. Um, I see all the Sullivan Awards that in Heisman trophies that Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor won. So good players, great, great players. And it's too bad somebody gets left off, but for him to be on the second team when he was the driving force behind a national championship to me is completely ridiculous. Yeah, I'm I'm all in favor of Jonathan Taylor being there, but Saquon Barkley over Ezekiel Elliott. Barkley no top way. 1,496 Never. yards in his second year. That was the most he rushed for in a season, and Zeke had two 1,800-yard seasons. So like that math to me doesn't work. Yeah, he had great highlights. You know who also had great highlights? Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah, 85-yard run against Alabama. The, the Indiana game was really incredible. What do you have? A 60 yeah. yard touchdown, a 70 yard touchdown, and an 80 yard touchdown. And they needed all of them. Yeah, they needed all of them because uh, the defense couldn't stop anybody that day. But uh, that was quite a shootout uh, with Cardale and, and uh, JT kind of jockeying back and forth. Yeah, that was crazy. I'll go with uh, I'll go with linebackers. You have Chris Borland, which is fine. Uh, I think Josie Jewell from Iowa, which is fine, and then. Devin Bush, which bothers me because Ryan Shazier should be on here somewhere. Devin Bush, I think, topped out at like 104 tackles one year and then 80 the next, something like that. Ryan Shazier as a sophomore had, I believe, 144 tackles and or a sophomore or junior, then you know, another 120 tackles the year before or after that. He was everywhere in the backfield. He was an insanely disruptive. And to leave him off of this list for Devin Bush – is crazy, and I'm not saying that as a Michigan hater, even though we've already talked about Jabril Peppers, the most overrated player of the decade. If you want to put on an all-decade player, uh, yes, all-purpose fine. Also overrated to win the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year in 2016 when you had Malik Hooker doing what he was doing that year. No. And so, yeah, I'll throw Devin Bush in here as well. I don't I don't understand it. It's it's It smacks of – recency bias and what you know 2013 2012 2011 what what were those those years don't apparently didn't exist to any of these voters because you know this was that this was also the same time during like manti teow and i would spend i don't know 18 20 hours on twitter telling people how much better ryan chazier was than teow based on the numbers the tackles in the backfield the disruption the, the I was I was going through box scores looking at when Teo was making his tackles compared to when Shazier was making his tackles. Shazier was making his tackles within, within three yards of the line of scrimmage or behind it, and Teo was you know eight yards and, and and past that. I was I was PFF before PFF um, because I was fired up about you know Ryan Shazier deserves more credit than he got then and more credit than he got now from these guys. Well. They went on the road to Wisconsin and Penn State, and as my memory serves, he basically single-handedly won both those games. I think he had a pick six maybe against Penn State in a close game and then had the goal line stand, and, and yep. I think he even forced a fumble on the goal line stand with Mon Mon Monte or Monte or Monte whatever. Ball. Monte, let's make a deal a ball. <laughs> so, you know, um, a funny story. Now, where was Shazier from? Was he from Plantation, Florida? Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Somewhere there in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. And so didn't he come to Ohio State because he wasn't the biggest Urban Meyer guy? And then like a year into his time at Ohio State, they, they hired Urban Meyer and they got along famously. Everything was great. But do you recall that, Tony? Was that part of his story that maybe he wasn't as enamored? Right. Meyer, Meyer had Meyer's great recruiter, but there were certain kids who just didn't take to kind of his abrasive, brusque, you know, matter of matter of fact is probably the the way you'd put it. Maybe not as I think he could be personable once he got to know a kid, but I think it was not something that was maybe easy for him. So um, I don't know what it was, but that I vaguely recall that he wasn't necessarily sold on Meyer, and that it was Ohio State and Florida for him. I think, and 
he, he picks Ohio State to kind of go away from Meyer, and then he gets saddled with him as his head coach. But it all turned out uh, for the good, and uh, he had a great NFL career, obviously, until he got hurt. And it's sad, I mean, that you see somebody uh, who's excelling at that level get cut down, you know, injury-wise and unable to to play the full 12-year career that that he could have played. And on that team, I mean, um, you know, a, te- a, che- a team that – consistently year in and year out has a punching chance of being in the Super Bowl or whatever, you know, I mean, that, that could have given him quite a legacy too. So um, it, it's too bad. Um, I don't know that Ohio state had a linebacker beside him that really uh, deserved consideration. Ohio state's mostly an offensive line, defensive line, running back. And, and, you know, I guess for lack of a better term now, a quarterback program, but um it hasn't always been a quarterback program. I'll say that. And uh, they, um, they've got a tough call here. Do you give it to Barrett Miller? Who, which of the quarterback, it can't be Haskins or Fields just on one year, even though both were phenomenal. Um, I think it's, I think it's gotta be Barrett. I mean, the 150 touchdowns responsible for the record was Drew Brees, like 104 previously. And he shattered that and put it so far out of reach. No one will ever touch that because anybody who's that good won't be there four years to touch it in the fourth year, in my opinion. So I think, I think Dwayne Haskins is the best of them, but then you're right, Steve, does it come down to, do you reward somebody for one year or do you go, do you go to the guy who has all of the other career records like JT Barrett? Do you go with the season records or the career records? And if it's an all big 10, if it's an all decade team, you know, I, I I guess you probably go with the with the career, but before JT, like Braxton, I mean Braxton was going to be setting all kinds of records if he would have had that that senior year as well, and I think they would have been more equipped to win a national title with him than, than Barrett. Uh, but I, it's still hard for me to put anybody over Dwayne Haskins for that year he had. But you know, is it is it a career? Is it or is it a season award? It's a career award. Yeah. If your career was within the decade, certainly. Yeah. Um, they picked a player of the decade in basketball. It was Frank Kaminsky from Wisconsin who got them to the national championship game and had an amazing year. So there will, in all likelihood, be a player of the decade for football, and I think it's it's mm-hmm. hard to give that to anybody other than JT Barrett yeah. as well. Um, you know, for all of his faults, he was really, you know, a, a, a very good player and, and uh, probably the best individual player in the big 10 for the time that they're doing it for. I'll just throw in for any Ohio state basketball fans out there. The the problem I had with their basketball selection was that Jared Thonger was a two time first team AP all American. The only one at a big 10 school in the entire decade, they had guys who made the first team once, but not twice. And he was on the second team, whereas Draymond Green, who was did it once, and Frank Kaminsky, who did it once, uh, were on the first team with a few other guys like Trey Burke and, you know, the other guys I'm not really quibbling with. But when you look at the numbers, Sullinger in his freshman and sophomore year, his career numbers, the two years that he played, he averaged like 18 and 9, something, and it was all high 9. It was almost 10 for his career. In their final two seasons, Green and Kaminsky both played four years. Their junior and senior numbers combined, their averages do not add up in any way, shape, or form to what Sullinger did as a first and second year player. And people say, well, he only played two years. Well, his two years was better than anybody else's two years in the course of the decade. Evan Turner was on that team. I don't know if Denzel Vought and Evan Turner only played three months in the decade because they <laughs> – and this is an issue, too. They took basketball and split the 2009-10 season and counted those three months, and then I presume counted the first three months of, of this past season in 2019, and that doesn't make any sense to me. I think if you're going to do it, you got to take 10 full seasons because Evan Turner has no business being on the all-decade team on the basis of three months, best player in the game for three months, but – Whatever. So, any rate, just my quick digression for anybody who also follows Ohio State basketball, just that maybe you try to do something like this, it's hard. 
I would also it. add it's that harder to get it right. <laughs> all decade teams should start on years that begin with that the end in one, not in in a zero. So the all decade team should be 2011 to 2020. Could be as opposed yeah. to you know yeah, and, I, as opposed to 2000 to 2010 or whatever. That's that's how I yeah, feel. I think the only reason we got this, I don't know if they ever did it in previous decades, no. is we're in a pandemic and there's no content yeah. for them. And this has filled two full weeks for them to reveal this. And uh, I give Dave Rebson and the guys a lot of credit. They they came through with some great interviews and features to go along with. Them. I mean, they got the whole vault of everybody's stuff for the entire decade. So it was it's made for decent programming and uh my guess is sometime today maybe we'll get the verdict on Barrett. And and I would have to believe that Urban Meyer, as a member of the Big Ten Network staff, is going to be the uh, coach of the year as, or coach of the decade as well. That kind of goes without saying. Let me real quick say uh, about centers. For me, Billy Price would be no better than third behind Pat Elfline and even Corey Lindsley. And, and after this year, although Josh Myers wouldn't, I guess, count with the all-decade team, I think – Josh Myers is going to be as good as any of those guys, but I'd, I'd go with Pat Elfline first, even though I think what Steve did he only have one year as a yeah. center moving from guard. So yeah, you know, I understand that as well. And Billy Price, but I, Billy Price, Michael only Georgia had. wasn't a slouch either. I yeah, mean, so they've they've had a bunch, and uh, they've got another one, and then and then Harry Miller behind Josh Myers coming down the road. You know, if you had to go with an all-purpose on offense, maybe it's Braxton Miller, just because he did have the one year where he moved from quarterback and played the wide out. I guess the H receiver position, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe he becomes all purpose because what he did, I mean, he was nothing short of amazing. I mean, yep. in his three years, an undefeated season as well. Uh, what would that be? The only undefeated season for a Big Ten team in the entire decade. He was the quarterback and the and basically the entire offense that year in 2012. So. Yeah, if it, it uh, he deserves a mention somewhere here. I don't know where he's going to get it, but yeah. So the JT Barrett um, comparison with the other quarterbacks is an interesting one because statistically, he, as Steve uh, outlined, is so far from a career standpoint ahead of everybody else. Do you just say career stats say JT Barrett's the guy, or do we actually? put the numbers into context, which we should, or even go another layer and say, just who are the better quarterbacks? Well, the, 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 as I scan through, I'm going through each team and I'm just thinking, man, Ohio state has this locked down because I'm coming up with a lot of good pedestrian quarterbacks at Iowa and Wisconsin in particular. We know what Michigan's produced their best quarterback statistically was actually a running back in Denard Robinson. Uh, if you want to take the totality of producing offense, uh, basically the two best quarterbacks in the conference did their best work at the next level. Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson yeah. was a one-year guy at Wisconsin, of course, had a great year, took his team to the Rose Bowl, but has become a all-time great at the NFL level. And Kirk Cousins is not at that level at the next at the, at the NFL place, but um, certainly a very capable quarterback making a ton of money and was very accomplished at Michigan State. Uh, and I believe his years would have been uh, 2010 through 11 for sure. He played those two seasons as the starter. So he leaks into the previous decade, I think, in 2009. Um, but um, I got to think Dwayne Haskins is the best quarterback on the field, but it's a one-year deal. Yeah. Um, Trace McSorley wins it. Then what do we do? Emergency show? Yeah. Uh, I don't recall who, who the analysis analyst was, but somebody made the point recently on Michigan and their foibles is that they have not had a truly elite quarterback in, I mean, the last time they won the big 10 was 2004. And I, I, I want to say that was John Navarre may have been the Henny is a freshman. Chad Henny. Yeah. Freshman. Chad Henny. Okay. Then and, Navarre. And, he, and he played in the NFL for a few years. So that's not, that's not outlandish, I guess, but they've run a bunch of guys through there. And of course you had the failed Rich Rod experiment where he, he took a look at Mallet and said, you know, he's, he's good, but for what he is, but he's not what we're looking for. And then he also went on and played in the NFL and uh, had a, a great showing at Arkansas, you know, so um, 
and, and you wonder why guys lose their job after three years, it's because they come in and go scorched earth and don't win immediately with the talent that's available while also bringing in the guys they want for their system. He would have made a lot of goodwill for himself had he gone in there with Mallet the first couple of years and won nine or 10 games and he would have got a five-year contract extension and, you know, could have set himself up. Instead, he was very short-sighted in, in believing that his system was going to win games in the Big Ten. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, was he uh, complete. He set that program back maybe 10 years because they they are still not out of, uh, you know, the hole that he put them in. I mean, to where back – they're not back where they were. Certainly. I mean, to where they were winning 10 games every year and all that, they, they rarely do that. So <clears throat> they seem to be pretty much in that same range, Steve, if you look at uh, what well, they've produced over the last uh, five years under Harbaugh versus Lloyd Carr. Yeah. It's his 97 championship. Uh, it's pretty much in the same range, but as, as you mentioned, they didn't have an Ohio state juggernaut to deal with to this degree. So they would yeah. sneak in and win some big tens. Uh, Tony, to your point, Devin Bush's best season. So you went through the tackle numbers, the total tackle numbers, but then you started to talk about disruptive plays. Devin Bush's best season, 10 tackles for loss. Ryan Shazier, 23 and a half. Shazier had 45 tackles for loss in his career. Devin Bush, 18 more sacks played on better teams yeah watch the games that's another thing you got to watch the games i'm gonna need to speak to a manager after this well, okay Devin bush is the same principle as peppers national top 20 prospect coming out of high school and gets tagged as the next big thing and then as long as he just starts games and plays in games and they hear his name called a couple times they think oh he lived up to the hype well you know he was good but yeah, you know. Jabril Peppers is a really good player, but very good, very good player. But I remember the game in Columbus. It was probably his last game before he sat out the bowl game. Actually, the Orange Bowl that year, he made a pick. Would that have been the year he played uh, 2014 through 16? Yeah, the epic uh, overtime game. Uh, he had an interception that was deflected right to him. It, any one of the three of us could have caught the football. It was deflected right to him, and they said, "This is Jabril Peppers." first career interception. Now we just outlined Antoine Winfield not making a pick, but different circumstances. They didn't throw at him. He's making tackles all over the Jabril Peppers is playing safety. He's in the traffic. He's not making plays that change games. He's good. Very good player. Tremendous athlete. I, you know, kind of Ohio a State fans. or uh, Charles Woodson. I'm sorry, Tony, go ahead. Oh. Ohio State fans were all over Peppers that year for not having an interception. And I remember tweeting at some point in like October, like, you, you Buckeye fans are guaranteeing that Jabril Peppers is going to have his first career interception against Ohio State with the way you are telling him that he's never had an interception. And like you said, it, it, it was tipped right to him. He had no choice but to catch it. The receiver was, what, you know, like two or three yards in front of him. So he would have given up the catch if it hadn't been tipped. So, you yeah, know, he, he was a fine player. But the, the funny thing is, if you look the next year when he was repla replaced by Cleek Hudson, Hudson had better numbers in 2017 than Peppers did in 2016. But Peppers, for some reason, was the, the you know defensive player of the year based on that. Like, Hudson had more tackles for loss, I think more overall tackles, uh, one or two interceptions. And, you know, we know Peppers only had one. Uh, it's just funny to me the, the way that hype uh, just – clouds everything when um for some of these for for so many professionals in this business he had a solid season 66 tackles but guys are racking up 100 tackles had 13 tackles for loss i'm sure that was top five in the league one pick three sacks and then uh you guys said it all about zeke and there nothing else to be needs to be said but i just have to yeah, you can go. It would be one thing if if Saquon Barkley ran for 2,000 yards, Zeke ran for 1,000 yards, and then Zeke went on the tear against the good teams in the important games. And then you could say, wow, we got we got to weigh this out. The guy that's the producer versus the guy that's half the producer but did it when the money was on the line. But Zeke did both. He outgained him. And then you got to put context to these numbers. He puts a historic run on those three teams. To, to lift a team to the first college football playoff championship. It's just, 
it seems like it shouldn't even be a discussion. You know, I have been ignoring this whole thing until today, you know, for this show. And now I'm just getting angrier and angrier about it. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to write about it just to, you know, for some catharsis. Oh my goodness. I did. I did write about the Sollinger thing last week because to me that that's just a, a complete fumble on their part. Um, I saw one of the comments here just pointing out as I'm looking at it, um, Row the boat, nice camber, uh, said Meyer wouldn't have started Haskins. He wanted Tate Martell. Dwayne scored 20 points versus Purdue. That wasn't the defense's fault, which, you know, uh, Dwayne did throw for almost 500 yards that game, but they only scored 20 points for some reason. Um, the issue that night was they couldn't stop Purdue uh, on defense. They uh, And, yeah, 20 points isn't enough to beat anybody, particularly on the road. But – even Purdue, but um, that loss in my mind was almost entire in that season in turn because that killed them from you know being able to go and realize their destiny. Um, was uh, Greg Schiano had no no plan uh, for the tight end? I think they caught like three or four touchdowns down the middle of the field. And the other thing was Urban Meyer maybe late in the first half. Uh, it was like a chip shot field goal for Purdue. And usually, you know, on the chip shot field goals, the kicker puts the ball straight up in the air so no one can – I mean, because it's just got to go 25 yards through the uprights. You're not trying to drive it 45 yards. You're just trying to get it above the defense and into the into the net between the uh, – and they tried to block it, didn't have contain, and they walked in on a uh, fake field goal touchdown. And he had no answer for that. That guy had been a coach for 15 years, and he gets schooled, you know, by whoever the Purdue coach was that day. I, I, I've, I've blocked the whole thing out of my memory. But um, they, you know, they lost that game as a team. I don't put that on Haskins. Maybe he didn't perform well in the red zone or something, and they only scored 20 points, and maybe threw a pick or two, or they turned it over. I got, I don't, I don't even know. Don't even care. But they did right before halftime. They were inside the 10 and did something stupid. Yeah, and fumbled the ball, and yeah, it could they have been one score game at half. I think they got stopped on downs inside the five yard line one time too. They they, they could have got a first down like the two yard line and didn't get it, or maybe went for it and didn't get it. But he, he also couldn't tackle Rondale Moore, so let's blame him. Exactly. For well, speaking so, of which, we get. <laughs> Speaking of which, we've got two wide receivers here. And and the one thing, as it appears as though it's going to shape up, I will respect the Big Ten Network for this. They are fielding a team in regards to the positions you would have on the field and the number of players. Uh, we did this with the all-ACC decade team, and they had six defensive linemen. So people just not wanting to leave certain people off, so we'll just keep adding people. <laughs> Another yeah. thing I, I don't like what the Big Ten does, and, and this is done with the all Big Ten team as well. You just have four defensive ends, and yeah, you know, they leave out the defensive tackles, and they do the same thing when they vote for the all conference team because defensive tackles don't no normally show up. They, in don't the stats. Stats. they don't have stats. You got to be a big daddy, Wilkinson, all American, to, or integral to winning games. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you got to be a, a big daddy, Wilkinson, like he was winning games up front to get noticed. And now, uh, granted. You could throw those four defensive ends that they have out there, and I think it'll be okay. But you know, let's you know, defensive tackles deserve a little bit more love. Yeah, and and on offense, do they do guards, guards, center mm -hmm. on the all Big Ten? They do. Oh, okay. oh all Big Ten. Um, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Do. I think so because Nick Mangold was never an all Big Ten guy hmm. because of the Minnesota center. Okay. Yeah. That's Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson, Minnesota, and Allen Robinson, Penn State, are the wide receivers. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw somebody. I don't know that anybody Michael. was pro, pro, who was prolific. Prolific. I mean, Those two guys. Yeah, they yeah. were. I saw somebody mention Michael Thomas or Devin Smith, and you know Thomas topped out at like seven hundred and fifty yards. Uh, they they split they split snaps at Ohio State for the receivers, so you're not going to have. The, the kind of numbers, but what Devin Smith did in 2014 is uh, is amazing. Uh, he he, Ohio State went undefeated in his career when he caught a touchdown. So that's yeah. If you want to look at big catches, mm -hmm. catches that it's matter, same, same premises as Ezekiel Elliott. 
I mean, yeah. in some regards. In um, some regards. I, I again, I don't think you ride a wide receiver to to, but man, when they get hot like Smith did against Wisconsin, it Katie bar the door. I mean, you you he was un uncoverable for even when he was covered. He was still even when he was covered. He was uncoverable. Yeah. KJ Hill racked up a lot of stats too, though. Yeah. I'd like to see his um, stats against those two. He helped them win a lot of games without being the most flashiest guy or the flashiest guy. He helped them win a lot of games and pulled their bacon out of the fire more times than people care to remember uh, with a lot of possession catches and a lot of fourth quarter catches to set up uh, important touchdowns or field goals or whatever. So, yeah, he uh, he was definitely uh, – uh, a key to Ohio State's success in many ways in this decade. But, you know, it goes back to the very first comment I made. When you dominate the conference to the level that Ohio State did in this decade, and I don't think anybody else won consecutive Big Ten championships in the decade. So you never had a guy, okay, let's say a Christian Hackenberg at Penn State or, or McSorley would have been their quarterback when they won it in uh, 16 or 17, whatever year that was. and then he also won another one. That never happened. So you can't there, – there's nobody you can point to at any of these other schools and say, oh, he won two Big Ten championships and was a major contributor on two Big Ten championship teams because it doesn't exist. I mean, uh, maybe Wisconsin won the first two championship games, I guess, way back when. So, yes, but, it depends how you count Wisconsin. In 2010, they shared with Ohio State and Michigan State yeah. before the championship game. In 2011, they won the championship game. In 2012. Ohio State's undefeated, but Wisconsin and they get in they lose six games. They go eight and six, and they're the Big Ten champion. Do you know what's funny about that year? I saw Nebraska play three times in person. I covered the Ohio State Nebraska game in Columbus, and Ohio State I think put up maybe sixty some, maybe sixty three points or something. I saw them give up four hundred yards rushing. I went to the Big Ten championship that game that year against Wisconsin. I saw them give up four hundred yards rushing to Wisconsin. And then uh, because Ohio State was on a bowl band that year, we took a family vacation to Disney and I covered the Under Armour game down in Orlando, Tampa, and also helped out our Georgia and Nebraska publishers by covering the Citrus Bowl. And I saw Georgia with Stafford throw for 400 yards against them. So I saw him give up 70 points to Nebraska in the Big Ten or to Wisconsin, in the Big Ten championship game. And at 2 in the morning, we're standing outside the Marriott Hotel where we were staying for the championship game. And Todd Jones, who was a columnist for the Columbus Dispatch, is standing down there, you know, 2 in the morning. We're all just getting, you know, just staying outside and enjoying some fresh air before it's time to go to bed. And these poor Nebraska fans are just, just seething mad about Bo Pelini and how bad their defense is. And Todd Jones, we would get quiet and go, he just looked at the guy about every five minutes ago, 70. You know, and just just say it out and out in the air, and the you know, just let it percolate. And the guy would say to him, "If you say that again, I'm gonna." Doesn't know him, just a Nebraska fan. Goes, "I'm gonna walk over there and I'm gonna punch you directly in the mouth." And then we get quiet again in about five or ten minutes, and Todd Jones would say, 70. and the guy would the guy go through it again. I mean, oh, you talk about getting deep pantsed. Uh, a championship game. Well, you're hoping to win the game to go to the Rose Bowl, theoretically, I guess. Uh, I don't even know wh where they would have gone uh, in 2012. Um, maybe the Rose – yeah, because it would have been double hosting. The, yeah, would have been, been double hosting. The, yep. Didn't they go down there and lose to TCU or something? Or I, I don't uh, know. That year was the uh, – that was in Oregon. Da, da, da. They lost to TCU in 2010. Okay. Then they lost to Stanford in 2011. They lost to was it Washington State maybe? Or, no, um, they lost to to uh, the 2011 team that beat uh, that Ohio State beat with the uh, hail mary. Braxton Miller, Devin Smith, that yeah. Wisconsin team with Russell Wilson lost to Oregon. Then they lost to Stanford in 2012. The team that had five losses going to the Rose Bowl lost to Stanford. They were all close games, really close games, but yeah. they lost all three. Yeah, I mean you're you're playing to go to the Rose Bowl you know, the Holy grail of college football and you give up 70 points. I mean, it's what was odd about Nebraska. We were talking Nebraska early in the show is that at the tail end of their big 12 run, 
They couldn't score. They had putrid offense. They had great defense with Endomic and Sue. They held Colt McCoy to 13, a 13-12 loss on a disputed last-second field goal that sent Texas to the national championship game in 2009. They barely lost two or three consecutive Big 12 championship games at the end of their run there with great defense. As soon as they entered the Big 10, they could score points and they couldn't stop anybody. Yeah. Just this role reversal out of nowhere. It's, it's been sad. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the good news for uh, the Big 10 is, as we said a couple times, I think, in this show, not this week, but in previous shows, is the Big Ten did a great job last year uh, going outside the conference and winning games. Uh, not Nebraska, notwithstanding, I think they didn't they go to Colorado and they lost. Um, but you know, by and large, most of the Big Ten teams won a marquee uh, non-conference game. So that kind of explained the power that the Big Ten had. You know, at the end when Minnesota was you know, in the top 15 and Penn State was in the top 15, Ohio State, Wisconsin, were all kind of bubbling up there at the end of the year. So um, if we have a full 12 game season, those are always important games to watch early in the year. And uh, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but there's one week where like the fifth best game involving a Big Ten team in maybe week two or three is Nebraska against Cincinnati. And that'll just give you an idea that in one weekend, there are all these marquee games lined up. And if you're a Big Ten fan, you can just sit there all day and watch great games one week out of the year at least. So that'll be cool. There you go. Good stuff from uh, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop, Steve Hellwagon, senior Big Ten writer at 247 Sports, Bucknuts. Guys, it's always a good time. Love traveling down memory lane. That's when I actually I can keep up with you guys because if it's the the current state of the Buckeyes, that's why you're my go-to guys. Keep up with all this day-to-day recruiting business and everything else because I can't do it. So thank you so much. You guys have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Yep. Have a great fourth. Have a good one.